we begin this morning by telling you thank you for being here and thank you for allowing me to preach to you. I just love it, and I don't know what it is. The more I preach, the better I love it. I don't know if it's the more I preach, the better y'all love it or not, but the more I do it, I love it, and I just want to thank you for it. It's been a great day so far here at the church, and as we looked in our lessons in the back as how to better witness and to incorporate what God has gifted us in uh, to minister to other people. Uh, it just inspires me, again, even though I teach the lesson, uh, to remember why I do what I do. And it's because our God reigns. If we don't serve a God that's off somewhere that doesn't care about who we are, but he's very active and alive in our life. And because of that this morning, uh, I reckon I could ask you the question, uh, do you feel that you are living in a life of spiritual victory? Because if we don't, we, we are really suffering. Uh, and so this morning, I want to talk to you about being a faithful follower of our God. You know, in anything in life, uh, in any successful campaign, you need good leaders and you need good followers. If you were to think about the military uh, just for a moment this morning, you know, if you need good commanding officers, you need good, strong leadership, but you also need those people who will get behind those leaders and obey their orders and go forward with whatever they've asked them to do. And see, if we don't have both of those two key components, any mission would be destined to fail. And so I asked you again this morning, do you feel that you are living a life of spiritual victory? You see, one of the things that we want to understand this morning is we're trying to mold our church to be the church that God wants it to be. Now, many of you have already told me uh, in, in so many words, you know, we're beginning to see a lot of different things take place. Now, you're visually looking at a lot of different changes, but also you're beginning to notice spiritual changes in one another. You're beginning to see that bond of fellowship that we talked about uh, just a few weeks ago and the importance of it and, and why it's so important to be involved in one another's lives. You're also understanding that as a God who is involved in our lives, his Holy Spirit is guiding you and leading you. And so this morning, uh, we're going to be finishing up this series of messages we've been going through. We're going to return back to the book of Psalms uh, in a few weeks, but right now we're going to finish up for a little while on the, on the book of Psalms. And, and I just wanted you this morning to understand what it means to be a faithful follower of our God. You see, we're going to be in Psalms chapter 9 this morning as we look at this passage. And we're going to find in, as we look in this passage, it's actually David's song of victory. But, but it's just as true that it could be our song of victory from a spiritual sense. Yes, God has delivered David as king and the people that have been following him into battle. And he has also secured the nation for, for David. But also we could look at it from a spiritual standpoint. And we need to understand that we can experience that spirit of victory. We can have a story of victory, and we need to know then the secret of victory. So I want us to begin this morning as we look and understand the spirit of victory. Look in Psalms chapter 9, verse 1. He says, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart, and I will tell of all your wonders, and I will be glad and rejoice in you, and I will praise I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. My enemies turn back, and they stumble, and they perish before you. You see, four times in just these first couple of verses, David says, I will. First of all, he says, I, I'll praise you. Secondly, he says, I will sing, uh, I will tell of all of your wonders. And then he says, I will be filled with joy. And then he says, I'll sing praises to your name. You see, he began by understanding who God was, you know. And so I think uh, we're going to understand and hear the Spirit of victory, then the first thing we need to understand is a spirit of victory is expressed in surrender. David says this, doesn't he? He says, I will, I will praise you, Lord, with all of my heart. Well, if you give all of something away, how much do you have left? Nothing. And he says, I will praise you with all of my heart. And so, in other words, I give you everything I have. In other words, I'm surrendering all that I have to you. And so if you show me a person who is living a spiritually victorious life, then most likely you're going to see a person who is completely and 100% and sold out and surrendered to Jesus Christ. And so I want you to be thinking about that as we, we, we go forward, because it sounds kind of backwards, doesn't it? When you think about the only way you can have victory is to surrender. 
Most of the time when we have victory, it's because we're taking that, uh, that forward approach. We are the ones that are on the offensive. But God says in the kingdom of God, to have true victory, you must be able to surrender. And so think about that. The reason why so many Christians aren't living a life of victory today, I believe, is because they don't understand. They're not prepared to, to thank the Lord, as David says, with all their heart. You know, uh, God declared that in 1 Corinthians chapter 21, verse 29, the New Living Translation says, No one can ever boast in the presence of God. And he says in Psalm chapter 50, verse 23, Who who sacrifices thank offerings honors me, God says. Uh, and so in other words, uh, you, you've got to bring it all right before the throne of God. And you've got to remember where everything comes from. You know, if, if the true spirit of surrender leaves no room for the glory in the flesh, and that's where we have a big problem because we don't want no one else to get the credit but me because I live in a society that teaches me that I'm supposed to get all the credit. And when my life is not going well, a modern-day uh, psychologist and psychiatrist will tell you, you do what makes you happy. You do what's best for you. Well, sometimes... What makes you think is best for you or what would make you happy won't be what would make God happy. And so we have to understand uh, how we are going to be spiritual beings living in a flesh, in a, in a, in a physical world. Uh, secondly, this morning then, we need to understand that uh, uh, that life is going to be expressed in, in openness. David says what? I will tell of all your wonders. It, it, victorious living is not a secretive thing. Uh, you know, you can be living a great life of victory, but somebody's going to know about it, regardless if you're telling it or just by the way you're living it. Uh, it you, know, you know people who are just like really in tune with the Lord. And, and, and you know people who God has truly blessed, and you know that their blessings are coming from God. And, and, and as a result of that, they're telling people. If nothing else, they're showing it with the works of what God has blessed them with. And that's another way of telling and, and so I want you to understand this morning that you need to be able to express in openness your life of victory in Christ. And David says this in Psalm chapter 40, verse 3. He, he says, put a, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many of you will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. In, in Acts chapter 4, verse 20, uh, you know, after Peter has been restored, after he has kind of walked away from the Lord, uh, and, and, and denied who he was, uh, and, and then he comes before the Sanhedrin after the Holy Spirit has come upon him, and he says this, he says, look, they tell him, say, you've got to quit talking, and you've got to quit preaching this name of Jesus, and the things that you're doing, you've got to put an end to it, and he says, uh, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. When God is working, and when God is granting victory, you've got to say something along the way. You just cannot sit back and keep your mouth shut. And my friends, we're trying to be a church where we're trying to help people change their lives. And we have to change first of all. But then if we're trying to help other people change their life and be, know who Jesus Christ is, uh, wow, we're going to have to be open about what God is doing in our lives. We're going to have to be able to be like Peter says, I can't help but speak about the things that I'm seeing and hearing about. Third thing this morning as we think about this spirit of openness. It is expressed in cheerfulness. Now, here's where we struggle. <laughs> because we, we, as Christians sometimes, we think that when we walk into church building, there should be a coffin stretched out in front of this table here. Uh, we don't think we should have any cheer. We shouldn't be happy. We shouldn't laugh. We shouldn't do whatever the case is. Uh, we, we should just come in here, ho, 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 ho. And, and we're just mumbling on through that thing and get on with it, preacher. Let's get on out of here. But the thing about it is, if we're living uh, that, that victorious life, we, we've got to understand that, you know, it, we have to be open with our cheerfulness. And, and Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, uh, gladness and joy are the appropriate spirit in which to enjoy the goodness of the Lord. Daily rejoicing is an ornament for the Christian's character and a suitable robe for God's choirs to, to wear. God loveth the cheerful giver, whether it be the gold of his purse or the gold of his mouth, which he presents upon his altar. Wow. You know, we've got to understand God loves it when we're happy. 
And, and if we're happy and we're cheerful about what God's doing in our life, share it with others. Help them to understand that, you know, the, the Christian life is just not a bunch of rules and regulations you have to follow so you don't have to burn and go to hell because there's so much freedom in the Christian life. And if we can live that type of life, people are going to want to have it. You see, there's a lot of things going on in people's lives right now that they're just down and out, and the last thing they want to do is have to walk into church where they have to be down and out. They're looking for a rescue from those type of things that they're living daily, regardless of whatever it might be. Well, if it's, uh, if it's depression or if it's physical sickness and, and pain, or well, if it's a spiritual uh, bondage in some way, or, or if it's some type of financial bondage that they're in, whatever the case is, if people can't see the joy of the Lord living in people, the last place they want to be is in the church. Because why do I need to go somewhere else where everyone else is down and out and depressed? I can be that by myself. I don't have to be a bunch of group of other people to, to, to understand that I'm not who I need to be. Fourthly, so we need to understand also gladness and joyfulness have always been the fruit of a revived church. I think we need that's be a given, don't you think? When, 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 when people are glad and their joy and, and that, that spirit is going to be there where they say, you know what, <laughs> there, there's something going on. The, the Lord is working. That's what the revived church is all about. It's going to be expressed in thankfulness. David says, I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. You see, in Scripture, singing is, is that inward uh, evidence of thankfulness. Uh, Paul says this, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, he says, Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know? Um, a thankful church. In other words, what Paul's saying is going to be a singing church. Uh, you know? Nothing wrong with singing. You might not be good at it, whatever the case is, but it's always something. It's an attitude of the heart. You know, I'm not good at singing, but, you know, around my house, I, you know, you can ask my, my wife and my children sometimes. They'll walk through and say, what are you doing? Who are you talking to? I said, I'm just singing to myself. You know how ridiculous you sound walking around here singing and talking to yourself? That's what they tell me. But maybe they're just talking about, you know how ridiculous you sound singing, and they just didn't want to, they just want to add to that last little part on there. But I'm joyful. I'm happy. And so you'll hear me walking through the church sometimes. Uh, uh, humming or mumbling to myself, but I'm actually just singing to myself. Y'all might think I'm crazy. Y'all might say, look, here he goes rambling on by himself again over there to himself. So he can head church right by himself in here today. But that's just who I am. I enjoy it. And I hope you would. David concludes this portion of his song by telling us why we should be filled with the song of victory. David says this. He says, my enemies turn away in retreat. They are overthrown and destroyed before you. He knows where all this strength and everything comes from. So we need to understand the spirit of victory. But we also then need to know we've got a story of victory. We have a story of victory. Look, uh, Psalm chapter 9, verses 4 through 6 says, For you have upheld my right and my cause. You have sat on your throne judging righteously. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their names for, forever and ever. Endless ruin has overtaken the enemy. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. Wow, when God does something, he does it, doesn't he? He don't mess around. He goes all the way. Let me just share with you three little I haves here. I shared with you some I wills in the first little point. First of all, God will rebuke the enemy. David says, you have rebuked the nations. You see, because he sits on his throne of the universe and he's judging righteously, uh, then God was going to have to rebuke because of who he is. But just because he is who he is and he's rebuking, then also that means if you're following him, there's times when Satan's going to get into your life, there's times when you're going to feel challenged, and, and, and there's some rebuking you need to do as well. When Satan's pressing in on you and he's, he's trying to get you to turn away from the Lord, nothing makes him happier than to see you slip up and stumble and fall. 
And just because you've slipped up here or you've stumbled a little bit along the way doesn't mean that God has forgotten about you, that he's written you off. But you have to tell Satan when he's telling you, see, you're not good enough. See, you're never going to be who God wants you to be. You've got to then stand up and say, you know what, Satan? I'm not going to allow you to tell me that because God in his great mercy and his grace has restored me through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand that this morning. Uh, secondly, not only does God rebuke the enemy, but God destroys the enemy. You see, God's always going to send a messenger. If you look back into the scriptures, uh, God always sent a warning. That warning was rebuke. And, and, and so he always sent a warning. He wanted people to turn and come back. But if they would not turn, if they would not come back, if they would not listen to his prophets, if they would not listen to his voice and his word, then God had to do what he has to do, and he destroyed the enemy. And so God destroys them. He says, you, David says, you have destroyed the enemy. And, and, and in other words, he's completely rendered it inoperable. It's not going to work anymore. And, 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 and so we need to understand that if we live in that life in Christ, that the Lord will deliver us. And look, he says this in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. He too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And, and so uh, John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's works. And so if you're looking for a way out of some of the things that you're trapped in, uh, you've got to turn to Jesus because this, he's the one that came to destroy what the devil has put out there in front of you that seems to be tempting you and, and, and miring up your way. The story of victory was once and forever spelled out when from the cross Jesus proclaimed with one word, finished. doesn't have to go back to the cross. The cross event won't, won't appear again. It was once and for all satisfying to God. And then not only does God rebuke and destroy the enemy, but David says, God forgets the enemy. You have blotted out our name, their, their names forever. You see, that thought is taken from the practice in ancient times when a family line, say, my name's West. And, and, and a family line just seems to stop. And, and, and there's no more heirs or whatever the case is. There's no more uh, someone to carry on that name. And so in civil records, a, a, after they found out there was no one else there, they would actually just strike their name from the record as ever existing because there's no one else by that name. We don't do that in today's society, but back in that culture they did. And that's what the imagery is here that David is giving, uh, that God is not only going to rebuke and destroy the enemy, but he's going to forget them forever. He's not going to remember them. It, it was God's part to vanquish forever our enemy on the cross of Jesus Christ. You know, uh, it, it, it's ours to celebrate the victory of faith because of that. You know, Satan can't really hold you down. That, that, you know, he might get in your face once in a while. He might throw up some, some, some bad decisions you've made. He might throw up some past sins that you have committed. But because of Jesus. You're not held bound and bound by them anymore. We oftentimes can't forget them, but God can because we've asked for the cleansing blood of Jesus to take care of them. And so David exclaims this, Endless ruin has overtaken the enemy. You have uprooted their cities, and the memory of them has perished. In other words, God's not going to worry about those kind of things anymore. And that's the story of victory. And you have to ask yourself this morning, is that your story? Is that the God that you serve? Is that the God that wants you to be one of his children? Is that the God who is allowing you to be one of his children? Third thing this morning, we need to understand then the secret of victory. Psalm chapter 9 verse 7 says, The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. Didn't say of judgment. What did he establish his throne for? Judgment. Psalms chapter 9, verse 20 says, Strike them with terror, O Lord. Let the nations know they are but men. We need a little taste of that today's society, don't we? We need a little 
you know, as we're serving God and we're worshiping God, that we also believe he's, his throne is there for judgment, that he's going to judge the nations. Now, we're not here like I... You, did you notice the little clip we played before in our intro now? It, it, it's inviting people to be a part of our church and, and let them know that they're welcome. But we're trying to help people understand that, uh, you know, accepting Jesus is just not to get out of hell free card. Uh, you don't hold on to it till the end gets there and you roll the wrong number and then it sends you, like Monopoly sends you to jail. And, and, and then you roll the wrong number throughout life and then when, when your time's ended up, you're still holding on to that card and say, well, one thing about it, I got this little card. I, you know, that's not who Jesus is. Uh, and I believe if we can really understand who Jesus is as, as a person, and we're trying to live a life for Christ and people see it, then we realize that he's someone we can serve, we can love, we can talk to. He's a real person. He's just not some entity out there that can overcome death. And too many people look at God as just some power that's more more powerful than death and not as a real reality that they can live through and live by. And so we need to understand that this morning. And so it's one thing to speak of the spirit of victory and to recite that story of victory, but it's a whole other thing to know the secret of victory. And David, David, he was sharing that with us here. And see, to him, the Lord was the God of righteousness. And he says this in verse 8, He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. You see, a God of righteousness can't do anything but what's right because that would be contrary to his character. Righteousness is just that. It is being in a right standing. It is knowing what right standing is. And because our God sets up what righteousness is, we follow in that path. He says this, the righteousness of God is the basis of all victory. Second thing he says is, He's the God of refuge. Not only the God of righteousness, the God of refuge. Verses 9 through 10 says, The Lord is our refu as a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in a time of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Time and time again, David had proved like what uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it. And are safe. Satan's going to tell you you're not righteous. Satan's going to tell you that your life's a mess. We remember what our dear friend Jeff Walling said. That's the reason you need a Messiah. You know? M-E-S-S. -S, it's your life. M-E-S-S-I-A-H. -S -S that's Jesus. One who overcomes. One who is sent from God. And so he is also the God of remembrance. Verses 9 through, 11 through 12 tell us, Sing praises to the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. For he who avenges blood remembers. He does not ignore the cry of the afflicted. You see, one of the subtle attacks of the enemy is he's going to remind you over and over and over again when you slip up, God's forgot about you. You're no longer worth anything to him. But that's not right. And so what we have to remember is God's going to remember you. He's going to remember that your heart is right with Jesus. He's going to remember that, yes, yeah, you may slip up from time to time. You may let that cross word come out of your mouth. You may say something against a brother or sister in Christ. You may slip up and, and, and tell a lie. You may, you know, have moral failure in your marriage. You may succumb to a past addiction. You don't know what's going to happen in your life. But remember what I've always told you. God's interested in the struggle that you have with sin. He wants to know that you're always struggling to overcome it, not simply to give in to it. And when he knows that you know that it's wrong, and he knows that you're willing to give it back to him, he's going to forgive you from it. And so remember that as well. Because our God is the God of redemption. Psalms chapter 9, verse 13 and 14 says, O Lord, see how my enemies persecuted me. Have mercy and lift me up from the gates of death, that I may declare your praises in the gates of the daughter 
of Zion, and there rejoice in your salvation. David, David recalls that time when he was snatched from the very jaws of death himself, and he praises God. And you know, every Christian in here has that same story to tell. There's something that in your life, there's that event in your life that's happened where you've been snatched from the jaws of death, if you're a Christian, when Jesus went to the cross and you accepted it as true. You accepted it as the only way to overcome death and look for eternity. You see, my dear friends, if because of that, God was willing to stoop down so low and it become a part of our lives that we don't have to worry about when the enemy comes and tries to tell us that we're going to be defeated because we have that great spirit of victory. We know what the secret is because our God is also a God of recompense. As we finish out, look what verses 15 through 18 says. The nations have fallen into the pit they have dug. Their feet are caught into the net they have hidden. The Lord is known by his justice. The wicked are ensnared by the works of their hands. The wicked return to the grave and all the nations that forgot God. But the needy will not always be forgotten. Nor the hope of the afflicted ever perish. So these final words of David or they should be very significant in our lives. Uh, and see, he, he, he knows that the Lord is going to be, he's going, his judgment, he's going to be executed, and, and that the wicked uh, and, and their snares and, and the works of their hands are going to be dealt with. And that's the reason Paul could say in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, he says this as he quotes the Old Testament, I will take revenge. I will repay those who deserve it, says the Lord, the New Living Translation says. Psalm 9, verses 19 and 20. David concludes it by praying this. Arise, O Lord, let not man triumph. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Strike them with terror. O Lord, let the nations know that they are but men. And you know what, this morning, I hope that you're understanding what this act of being a faithful follower is all about you know what the spirit of victory is and you know what your story of victory is and you know what the secret of victory is because you've got a great challenge before you you've got to help people understand that you know what victory is all about and, and and it doesn't happen in this room it can't happen here because look around you Many of the faces that you're looking at, you've known for years and years and years, and many of them have already come and known who Jesus Christ is. And you'll, you'll sit there, and you've been back there nodding your head, and amen, and preacher under your breath, and all this kind of stuff. But the truth of the matter is, people are out there hurting, and they don't know Jesus. And they're looking for a way to overcome defeat in their life, and they want to know what victory is all about. Maybe some of you today are thinking about that. And you want to say, really, I need to know what the spirit of victory is all about. Just tell me the secret. I want to have that story to tell. And so I'm telling you, it's Jesus. But there's somebody out there waiting that you may know. And they need to know that story. Before we have our decision, I want you to just hear a plea from someone you don't know. There may be someone you could encounter throughout this week. And let her tell you her story. When's it going to happen? Here I am. There you are. Here I am, desperate for love, for truth. What are you going to do when you leave this building? Are you going to share with me what you've been learning here today? Or are you just going to bottle it up and pull it out next week for your friends? Now when I say share, I'm not talking about every tactic you've used on me in the past. Like judging my every move, telling me I'm a bad person, pointing fingers, giving me disgusting looks. <laughs> and my favorite is when you tell me that I'm lost. I don't even know what that means to be lost. Do you really think judging me is going to make me change? Would it make you change? Now, I, I know I'm a bad person. I've, I've done bad things, but I don't need you to tell me that. What I need is for you to pick me up when I fall down. 
to be there when I'm broken. Yes, there's, there's something missing in me. There's a void in my heart that I don't know how to fill. You have it. You have that thing that makes you whole. You know that person that I need to know. So I'm watching your every move. I'm watching where you go and what you say and do. Because I'm desperate for something real. I need something genuine to know that there's something more here than this. I mean, this, this can't be it, really. And I think you know that. Listen to me. I need you. I need you to be here for me. I need you to walk out right now, ready and willing to do whatever it takes. Hey, it's, it may not be comfortable. It may not be easy. But I need you to show me love. No matter the cost, show me what unconditional love really looks like. Stop telling me about this God of yours and show me who he really is. Honestly, I'll probably resist you. I'll probably argue with you and laugh at you. I'll, you know, even when you fall, I'll probably call you a hypocrite. But don't give up on me. Please don't give up on me. So I'm gonna ask you, when's it gonna happen? Maybe there's someone here that never been baptized into Christ and you want to get that taken care of and get it out of the way. Maybe someone wants to play fellowship with us and you want to say, I want to be a part of what we're trying to do as we reach people. Whatever it is that God's laying on your heart, we're going to give you an invitation. As we sing, Lord, I'm coming home.